Yeah, Baba Brinkman, Tucson Consciousness, doing a wrap up. Check it out. This is Baba Brinkman, recording live from Consciousness Central, bringing you the Tucson Science of Consciousness info, giving you the essentials to explain what's subjective and sensual, making love to your mental, cause I'm the consciousness nympho. Any theory I'll F with it, whether it's daft or exquisite, whether it's backed by the facts or suffering an evidence deficit, this is Tucson. Where the tent is hella broad It's half science lab and half burning man afternoon workshop Day one, plenary one Stan Dehain Kedish kicked it off on the global neuronal workspace And how the system evolved To broadcast information across neocortical space The same way I'm broadcasting this Achieving fame in your brain Check the meta context The parallels are insane My distributed sensory signal is spreading through your membrane Consciousness explained By a simple rap and rhyming It doesn't be become conscious until it metastasizes, hence I'm broadcasting live, you're getting a spike of activation, it doesn't become conscious till hundreds of milliseconds later and Stan the man can mask it and make sure you forget it like a mouse in a maze hooked up to optogenetics computational, it's 10 to the 16 operations a second but according to Stuart Hammerhoff that's off by like 11 orders of magnitude, it's really 10 to the 27 operations per second in a quantum superposition so there's no consensus the conference is gonna fall apart if the theories are not in the same galaxy never mind ballpark so let's talk about a theory mostly ignored so far by the mainstream neuroscientists Orc OR, take a dose of psilocybin, let go of social approval and bing, wrap your mind around the molecular structure of tubulin and the fluctuations of benzene pi electron resonance. Try your best to figure out what its quantum superposition is. Bing, better be quick, it's gonna reverse polarity. It disappears if you stare at it with a heart full of no charity. It's got bing, but it's still too indeterminate to measure. The evolution of life began with primordial proto-pleasure, Darwinians talk about surviving and getting by but Stewart's theory is more like vibing and getting high it's about emojis resonating with oscillational sounds I need a hit that's some good transcranial ultrasound Stewart used to have a persecution complex no one wants me lately he's more like the orc OR Rocky with the eye of the tiger baby comeback kid cocky now that his waveform collapsed into collaborations with Noam Chomsky but I sense a discrepancy between the sensory data that Stuart gets and the preconceptions etched in his gray matter. He could link quantum gender superposition to cross-dressing. Anil Seth would call it predictive processing. Consciousness is a Bayesian fantasy constrained by reality, which explains Stuart's everything is quantum mentality. He's got a smoke detector that's constantly going off, like a virtual reality set that over-identifies dogs, because sensory data is noisy and conspicuous, which makes a quantum false alarm seem extremely conspicuous the question is will anyone snap him out of his trance who's gonna stick a fork in Stuart's rubber hand god damn did I go too far that was mean that's my nature though I'm a freaking beast machine just ask Anil Seth that's the animal in man I predict myself therefore I am Tucson consciousness central Baba Brinkman wrapping up the plenaries peace out Day two began with the reality check. Flights of bloomin' fancy. They're all fun and games until you lose your grip on reality. Alzheimer's disease savagely tearing through the tapestry of your memories. Forget about Batman, call Rudy Tanzi. Once your memories are lost, people, there's no going back, forever wandering in a tangle of amyloid plaques. Those plaques are the foot soldiers of the brain's innate immunity. But foot soldiers who run amok are a threat to the whole community. That's the end of any consciousness of a higher order. As Richard Brown would put it, the horror, the horror. That's a representation of a representation, a funhouse hall of mirrors distorting your mental matrix. So don't forget to get enough sleep. That's mental floss. And socialize, and exercise, and overdose on cat's claw. Me and Rudy were rocking out at the hospitality suite last night. We were flirting with Alzheimer's because of sleep sacrifice. But Rudy reminded us, the disease only destroys the 
the ego in the Deepak sense. The true self transcends the disease though. I've been looking for my true self. It's harder to find than Nemo. Overall, I'd rather keep my ability to identify people. According to Deepak, evolution is driven by purpose and consciousness is the ground of existence beneath this shallow surface. It's the kind of scientific theory that churches support. But I thought intelligent design was struck down by the circuit courts. No matter, the courts are no match for Deepak's holy alliance, and the modern scientific method is no match for qualia science. The universal constants are fine-tuned to keep us alive, and the new standard of evidence is whatever feels right. That's right, feelings are everything. Not just to us, they're literally everything. The universe is quality dust, and the purpose of evolution is to provide experiences of every kind, which means the tapeworm in your belly is a manifestation of the divine. Our feelings, our perceptions, our experience, that's all there is. There's no objective reality untouched by consciousness. I know it sounds narcissistic, solipsistic, and self-absorbed, but you'll see for yourself when your qualia goes back to potential forms. Until then, I can't think of a way of testing his thesis, not from within the inescapable subjectivity that defines each of us. All I know for sure is Deepak is friends with famous people and the sound of his incomprehensible lecture made me feel peaceful. <laughs> but earlier in the day, Anurban Banjopadai took to the pulpit and said he didn't publish a book because he decided later that it was bullshit. How refreshing. The man is intellectually humble, dedicated to making the brain as a computer model crumble. He's one of the outlaws, challenging the orthodox positions, speaking from his heart, which he considers demonstrably non-algorithmic. Between the bing, information is coded in silent pause, and a lady with no cerebellum is a happy day for the outlaws, which is kind of twisted. It turns out neurons are more complicated than we thought. 26,000 proteins containing 27 kinds of clocks, and I give Anurban props on his quest to explore humans. But all I could think during his talk was, damn, his poor students. <laughs> They could be home listening to Celine Adesoy's music. Connectome harmonic wave patterns produced it. Basically, if you want to know where Celine got her thoughts, it's from the same oscillation pattern that gave the leopard its spots. And what about Dave Chalmers' talk? It was magic. A 40-minute justification of his video game habit. What do you mean I'm wasting my life, Mom? You can't understand how I feel. The world of World of Warcraft is totally real. <laughs> but hey, maybe virtual reality is where it's at. An Oculus Rift can teach us what it's like to be a bat. And now Tuchia can assess the integrated information as a loss of probability of past states when the measurement's taken. So strap on your headsets, tune into the VR matrix, and experience the integrated phenomenology of faceness firsthand. That's why this universe was created, just like Deepak said, to give us VR qualia manifestations. So let's fly and experience so our echolocation while Jakob Howie breaks down the five roads to consciousness taken and navigates us to predictive error management at the fork. That's the kind of journey we came to this conference for. Yeah. On day three, I started out in the morning feeling extremely chill. Aaron Sugar was there to murder Benjamin Libet on free will. I hadn't had any coffee yet, but still I was feeling wide awake. And when would I reach for a cup? What's the basis of every decision I make? Which phrases would I choose to adapt in today's rap? I say choose because it's predetermined. I can't explain what I happen to grasp. All I know is I'm feeling focused. I'm steady with the mental. You want me to rap? I rap. That's my readiness potential. I felt the choice building up in my head with a sense of poise. But according to Aaron, that feeling is nothing but random noise. Or at least those are the questions over which he can't sleep. Hey Aaron, you better check your habits. Are you sure it's not the caffeine? 
hook a subject up to EEG and tell them to act of their own volition, spontaneous fluctuations subject to pattern recognition, a false positive in the flash photo of time-locked averaging. Google mapping recognition software could tell us what's happening. If Google can tell the difference between a husky and an Eskimo dog, it could tell us whether Libet's action potential is random or not. Christian Segedny, he works on this kind of ad automatic feature extraction, but wait, his talk is later in the day. Am I living the day backwards? I felt dizzy. Somehow my mind was time traveling, jumping from talk to talk with discrete stimuli overlapping. A traffic light was flashing, but I'm persistent. I'm an object deducer. I felt like Marty McFly, and Doc Brown was Ron Gruber. Great Scott! I must be trapped in a quantum time entanglement, ghost busting the paranormal with Egon Spangler and Peter Venkman. So who are you gonna call when the spirits take over the conference? No question at all. I'm calling Julia Mossbridge. Julia, oh my god, I swear I've probably lost it. I'm having premonitions of today's talks. Call me a parapsychologist. I totally saw Daniel Sheehan talk about precognition, but he doesn't start for 20 minutes. Is it spooky action at a distance? Is it retro causation, time warping by quantum physics? How does free will emerge from all these random intuitions? I never wanted this burden. I never asked to be a medium. I just wanted to compose rap poems like I'm Shakespearean. But after this afternoon, I feel like my effort is wasted. Now that Shakespearean verse can be automatically generated. Oh, wait, how did I know that? Christian's talk doesn't start for hours. I need to set up shop with a crystal ball and some mental powers. There's no place for me to chill and abide like the Big Lebowski when I'm quantum entangled in time. Explain that, Martin Nowakowski. Skeptical scientific minds can roll their eyes and call me crazy, but they can bite me because I'm dancing with the ghost of Patrick Swayze. I'm a time lord moving faster through time than Ruth Kastner. I might go backwards in time and train Hitler to be a ballet dancer. He can change. We can all change. Using human volition, every decision collapses a wave of quantum superposition. Or maybe my brain is backdating subjective events tenaciously, weaving a story with Maddie Vori about my own sense of agency. I can't tell if it's merely confusion or worthy of Confucius. Free will is supposed to be unpredictable, but not stupid. Functionally unpredictable, lyrically unscripted, making decisions in which my visceral body plays a central role. I'm still sitting here in the morning, listening to Aaron Sugar's talk, wondering who's going to come and explain all my precognitive thoughts. I have to get up and move, but wait, that message is best ignored. I'm like a rat, impatiently accepting a lesser reward. So I sit still, and I send out my psychic feelers into a new future, overflowing with quantum annealers, built by Helmut Nevin, random arrays of 40 three cubits, providing solutions for elusive problems that don't exist, but they will exist. Class of computing, it's slow these days. It's no match for the quantum tunneling habits of D-waves. I, for one, welcome the day Google machines will enslave us. I'm tired of the burden of being a free-willing, conscious agent. I want to live in a world of psychics, leprechauns, and centaurs, in which all my stupidest doodles are instantly turned into Renoirs. I'll just want under the landscape of time with its churning sands and kick it with Stuart Hameroff and Helmut Nevin at Burning Man, expanding consciousness with the help of Amazonian shamans. Cause you know, that's just the kind of crazy day that today was. The Consciousness Conference in Tucson. So many theories on display, you would have thought Stuart got them from Groupon. Gifted minds exploring the higher mysteries scientifically. Let's revisit the theories and the order they emerged in the course of history. Beginning with quantum physics and the challenge of superposition. The universe, indeterminate, a vast unmeasured system with irreducible properties like mass, consciousness, and heat, according to the panpsychism of Kelvin McQueen. 
Interaction is dualism. It's a simple quantum mechanics. The integrated information of phi causes collapses. But the phi level was low directly after the Big Bang. Just a smear of potential existing in higher dimensional space. According to Alyssa Nay, whose brain whips and nays around the concept of quantum smears with the texture of mayonnaise. She's got a Michelin chef. Yes, a trained metaphysician. Everything is superposition under wave function realism. Her theory had one flaw, and she was able to admit it. A universe with no collapse would have no macro objects in it. So in the beginning, there was no one paying attention. There would be no definite shapes or splits into separate dimensions. No brains, no cells, no biological entity. But the quantum state world, it still evolved probabilistic and on one planet at least, there evolved the primitive sentience with functional mechanisms to fight the entropy threatening it. Chaos, the barbarian at the gates of, uh, barbarian horde at the gates of life. So constraints evolved to regulate cells from the inside. Transmissions of information extrinsic to the medium from the mind of Terence Deacon to the cytoplasm of, from the mind of Terence Deacon to the cytoplasm of a paramecium. Paramecium and medium, right? Yeah. A spontaneous molecular tessellation adapting to environmental conditions using stereochemical matching. Tessellation, a molecular interlocking network of nucleotides and lipids, reminiscent of M.C. Escher. Of course, nothing as complex as Terence Deacon had yet evolved. Just a vegetative sentience wrapped in a cell's walls. But even a vegetative sentience has basic affects and the ability to express its emergence and attractions thanks to the molecules of emotion. The simplest cells can actually feel. It gives rise to the emotion emotional vitalism of Catherine Peel. The enlightenment rejection of vitalism left Catherine feeling negative, so she brought it back as enlightenment and subjectively resurrected it. Over the years, our basic attractions and aversions have evolved into higher sentience, including ethical virtues, although I do admit to feeling a bit skeptical, actually, because her list of biologically based virtues strangely included chastity. I guess the celebration of sexual freedom isn't the rule when a theory is formulated at Harvard Divinity School. And how do we get to consciousness from just the molecular soup inside a single cell? Our hero, Stuart, comes to the rescue. Yeah, she said, our hero, Stuart, comes to the rescue. We're saved. But wait, is it just me, or is that the kind of phrase that was heard less often on a Tucson stage back when this conference was co-organized by Dave? Anyways, these basic emotional states animals feel go from angry to chill, from Hillary to Trump to Catherine Peel, and the challenge is still to be more like bonobos and less like chimps, although random sex, that's still a no-no. Catherine's emotional vitalism can provide answers, even when your fiancé leaves you for someone whose father is dying of cancer and your uncle is suffering from PTSD, which sends you on a quest to overdose him with ecstasy which means this is a theory with practical applications guiding the evolution of life through infinite adaptations from paramecium through fish, reptiles, and finally rodents from Anthony Houdet's. He loads up the rodents with massive anesthetic doses. Even the quantum superpositions explored by Calvin McQueen are no match for Tony with a tank of isofluorine. A rat with a mac microscopic array having a conscious experience reveals a dynamic clustering pattern of spiking neuronal sequences. What a relief. He was the first person all day to say that that neurons are relevant and have a role to play. The pattern of interaction between them are sparse and disconnected compared to awake states when they're subjected to anesthetic. That's what I'm talking about. Neurons interacting. Let's get it cracking. Time for Georgie Busaki on mental mapping. The nerve cells in your brain specifically map the physical space, which gives us a framework to explore future and 
present states. I, I can't say that much about neutrophil substrates or superfluids transforming to gases and back in a quantum wave. I, I just feel happy, a happy affect when neurons interact, even if there's more to it than that. It's no shade to Henry Stapp. It's no shade to teledendrons arrayed in a, wet, arrayed in a web of energy or holonomic brain theory with its holistic symmetry. I don't know if it really is dendrites, dendrites, dendrites. I just know I wish I could have had more of Carl and Walter's insights. In the evolution of life, from the Big Bang to the highest sentience, I'll put Carl Kriegram and Walter Friedman at the head of it, as Karen Shannon carries the banner and the torch is passed on. I will always keep their memory in my axons, axons, axons. Day five and the level of spooky action is truly massive. Psychokinetic attacks on the status quo. Is it loopy magic or does the remote viewing of a double slit truly impact it? Either way, the crowd in Tucson is enthusiastic. Let's suspend disbelief, set aside the results we wanted and achieve a childlike state of psychedelic consciousness. The more you know, the less you see. Just ask Alison Gopnik, magnetize my frontal cortex and I'll find I'll find a novel use for an object. I'll find a novel use for the internet, like meditating in front of it, visualizing the microscopic effect that Dean Radden is gonna get, manifesting a world in which his noetic effect replicates and gets published in science and nature instead of physics essays, visualizing a world in which we're not embarrassed to dissolve our egos, supervised by Robin Carhart Harris. One psilocybin trip is a top five highlight of our lives. So how how am I supposed to decide when I did it like 99 times? I'm <laughs> I'm permafried, exploring possibilities like tripping two-year-olds, low temperature searching for blickets like New Caledonian crows. I used to be a peckin' chicken skeptic who rejected it all, like my serotonin 2A receptor was antagonistically blocked, but now I'm tripping balls. Ego dissolving psychedelically. According to Robin, it's a disruption of my default mode neck. Now I'm tripping balls. Ego dissolving psychedelically. According to Robin, it's a disruption of my default mode neck network integrity, but that's irrelevant from the perspective of my subjectivity now that I'm free to explore spaces of quantum possibility. Classical physics is causally closed, but biology is quantum. I'm in a lab mating prolifically with half anesthetized Drosophila until the conductance properties of my electrons become anomalous and my consciousness blossoms under the supervision of Stuart Kaufman. I'm in a cat's body, trapped in a box. Did the wave collapse yet? I'm supposed to be dead or alive but instead I'm half dead. God damn it, this box is messing with my head as an existentialist. I wanted a definite outcome, but damn it, Dean Radden's meditating next to it. I <laughs> I leave the feline and enter the rodent's neural connectedness until my cortical cortical transfer is ketamine blocked by an anesthetist. As a rat, I straight up hate to be on my back in a table with George Mashur hovering over me, peering down into my K-hole. Just another, just another rat in the pack, a rat in the rat pack on my back under anesthetics. Is George really studying me or just indulging his foot fetish? I can't tell. I'm in a vegetative state, complete thalmic atrophy, experiencing a rapid reduction of oxygen cardioactively. I'm visiting relatives, flashing back on my life. I see people in heaven, my serotonin surges. They're measured by GMO board jijin. Electrodes in my skull, GMO's measuring my neurons. The connectivity's kind of hot, but the asphyxi... Uh, the connectivity's kind of hot, but the asphyxiation's not really a turn on. What's my safe word? I'm flooded with norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, GABA, and pure adrenaline. This woman is crazy. Someone come and arrest her. An administrative voice says we can't touch her. She has tenure. <laughs> Suddenly, I snap back to Earth like heaven doesn't want me. I'm back in my body, a coma patient supervised by Martin Monty. I still can't move, but at least my vitals are replenished. I can hear Martin shouting at me, Baba, imagine playing tennis. 
I can imagine it. That means I must be locked in, locked inside the Kiva ballroom, trapped in an infinite conference. I, I picture a tennis court outside the doors and wake up, flashing back to a series of crazy dreams, too crazy to make up. What happened in there? Where did I go? How did I come back? Was it a crazy DMT trip in Robin and David Nutt's lab? Who knows? But I gotta thank Stuart for passing his light to the rest of us, a luminous presence, a passion to find answers, and, and you know, take every theory and question it. How does that light giving work? I don't know. I'm a skeptic. Ask Peter Fenwick. I'm just saying, Stuart's no Alan Forge, but we're still not likely to forget this. It's a good thing psychedelics don't turn out to be habit forming, because I can't wait to come back for another dose of Tucson brainstorming. Damn! Woo! Thank you. And that's the whole story. <laughs>